And I was, phoned my agent. I said, did we hear anything about um, Sherlock, by the way? He said, well, actually, yes, we did. They didn't really feel you were that into it. I was like, well, why? What do you mean? He said, well, they just felt you, you hadn't really turned up. <laughs> you know, I was like, F Well, can you please let them know I'm really interested? I think your script is brilliant. Sorry they felt that. I, let, let me, you know, let me do it again. I can't believe this. You don't accept any responsibility whatsoever for your brother's death, do you? If you're so good at asking questions, ask Martin. You'll get more out of him than me. Can I go yet? Every actor that came out of drama school was either on the bill or casualty or both. And it was kind of like it was a... Uh, it was extended drama school for people. It was my first time in front of a camera and I think it probably shows. I had that slight deer in the headlights thing, I think. A little bit. Yeah, I was playing a small-time crook. I used to go up for a lot of small-time crooks before uh, I became lovable uh, boy next door. <laughs> uh, I used to, yeah, I used to play, I used to play and go up for weirdos and scumbags. But um, I'd been out of drama school for one year at that time. I, I, I filmed it in 1996, and I'd come out of drama school in 1995. And I was in the midst of doing a lot of theatre and going up for the occasional bit of TV. No, not on this, though. You can't do it on this. No, it's on shoes, though. No, I used to do it. Oh, no, yeah, I know how to do it. I used to all that stuff as well. Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, all that sort of stuff, yeah. Just, like, complete control of the body. And it's all that now, isn't it? Yeah, I know, it's all... Busy? Right. Yeah, just, uh, keeping up the morale. Can we have a chat? Yeah. I'd met Ricky Gervais on a, a sketch show called Bruiser for the BBC that he wrote for. It was six of us containing some fantastic... Uh, British comedy talent who have gone on to m much bigger and better things, including Olivia Colman. So I did a lot of sketches with Olivia Colman, and even then she was uh, very good. I was then called in to do this uh, audition for uh, The Office. I first auditioned for Gareth Keenan, who was then played by Mackenzie Crook afterwards. But I, I read for Gareth, and then I was on the way out, and either Steve Merchant or Asha Talla, the producer, said, actually, I think we should get Martin to read for Tim. I was like, okay, because I'd read the whole script. I thought the script was really, really good. So I came back read for Tim, and there was a bit of a, oh, th that might work better. So th yeah, thank God they'd stopped me from leaving the room. I probably wouldn't have got Gareth, because Mackenzie's much better casting as Gareth. You know, Ricky and Steve let me have a couple of, I guess, I guess a couple of episodes before, rough cuts of episodes. I remember showing it to a couple of people who I cared about, and they were impressed. <laughs> Obviously, it's not the first mock documentary thing ever. Of course it's not, but it was, I think, one of the best executed of, of that kind. And certainly in 2001, before it had come out, there was, there wasn't really anything like that on television at the time at all. And again, you know, Spinal Tap is still the best. But uh, but we were in their shadow and trying to obey the things that they had learned and done well. I, I was very excited by it. He's gonna get himself killed. Hey, yo, yo, cheers, the LAPD, man. Yeah, and? Um... <laughs> oh, man, you are a bad mouth, man. As my first film, as my first movie, and, you know, Ali G had a kind of, uh, had a television life in the UK, and it was very popular, it was on Channel 4, and everyone used to talk about this character, it was amazing, and who is this guy, oh, apparently he's some guy who went to Cambridge, really, like, so a little bit more kind of was leaking out about who Sasha Baron Cohen was. I just finished shooting The Office, and then I was doing Ali G, and it was very exciting, it, I felt vaguely successful, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, and I was, yeah, no, so I played Ricky C, Ali G's best mate. It was ludicrous, very silly. <laughs> um, there was a tiny bit of improv. There were improv moments, definitely. The improv moment in the scene that, that ended up in as a scene in the film where cut wasn't called and me and Sasha just did a load of rapping and beatboxing in a car. A to the L to the I to the G, Ali G, that's me, that's me. A to the L to the I to the G, that's G, that's me, that's me. R to the I to the C to the K to the Y, that's Ricky C, Ricky C to the C to the C, Ricky C, Ricky. Oh, where's it? I was going to be late for my class. Let's oh. go. To be fair, it's a good scene. Did I get co-writing credit? Did I f***? Did I f***? Um, no, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Sasha and Dan Mazer, who was like his co-creator, I suppose, and his sort of spirit animal, uh, were, you know, really funny blokes and clever guys, and I liked them a lot. Probably the worst costume I've ever had, I think, you know. Lurid, some would say. Very, very lurid colours. I wasn't going to win any Best Dressed Awards for that. Could you take the top off this time? Lighting and camera need to know when we're actually going to see the, um, the, the nipples and, and when we're not. Yes, OK. Right. Well, at least it's nice and warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not always the case, is it? I was, um, I was standing in for Brad Pitt once. I'm you know, seven years in Tibet. Yes, yeah. 
bloody freezing. Right? Yeah, sorry, guys, time's pretty tight and we have to get the actors in. Fine. I promise I won't run. <laughs> I got attached to Love Actually because on the back of the office, Richard Curtis wrote me a very nice and flattering letter that contained a piece of chocolate in it. Like, it was wrapped. It wasn't, he hadn't just dropped it. It was like a wrapped chocolate, like, presented to me, saying, I love the office. I love what you did in the office. It was amazing. <laughs> it sounds like such a f***ing... I just realised how conceited that sounded. I'm just telling you how much Richard Curtis loved me. What's wrong? I'm just, I'm just passing on facts. You know, he was, I think he's very good at writing people flattering letters when he's a fan of someone, and he was a big fan of that show. He's a big fan of The Office, so he wanted me to come along and play. And so we did a table read for Love Actually with a lot of people who didn't end up being in it, just some good comedy people. Later on down the line, it was cast properly, and unfortunately I was still in the cast. The Beagle made it a dead giveaway. Yes, well, so did I. <laughs> I guess most of the people who come to these sort of parties are drunken idiots. What? I'm all these people are idiots. God. I went up to read for Arthur Dent for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on a houseboat um, in London that was the business, uh, belonged to the business of Nick Goldsmith, the producer, and Garth Jennings, the director. And, and I had a fantastic time with these two. Talking about the film, they showed me some of the designs. I think I read a bit as Arthur. But what I was really thinking about was the fact that m my missus at the time was waiting for me in a car. And, and so I was feeling guilty that I, sh I should go because Amanda's parked and I didn't, want to, I didn't want her to be too bored or whatever, you know. So I was kind of, okay, yeah, it's all very well. Yeah, you want me to be the lead in the film, great. But I've, I've really got to go. So yeah, that, I think that's one of the things that saves me or saved me. I'm quite good at thinking about something else. So not thinking about, oh my God, Arthur Dent, it's a really sought after, and I was hearing names in the ether about, you know, who was being considered for Arthur Dent, you know, and some of them were Hollywood stars, which I certainly was not. So I wasn't thinking, oh, this is, this is a big thing. I was thinking, are we gonna get home in time for dinner? Yeah, it was Sam Rockwell, Zoe Deschanel, and most deaf as he was. Oh, that was, it was good fun. It was really, really good fun. Everyone looked really cool, apart from me. I had a fucking great, sort of house coat, like a big green toweling, terry toweling robe, pajamas and old man slippers. Most looked amazing, Zoe looked great, Sam just looked like Elvis Presley and James Brown, like, and I, and there was me. So sometimes I've got a bit of an inferiority complex about that. I'm your best man. Yeah, of course you are. Of course. You're my best friend. <laughs> I knew as soon as I started reading it that this was unlike anything that I was seeing on television at that time. Ben Cumberbatch was on board as Sherlock and I thought that was a very, very smart move because what I'd seen him in, he was brilliant. I went up for it twice. I, I went up first time and apparently I, I subsequently learned I'd been a bit of an idiot. I don't know what it, I can't remember what it was, a bit of a schlep to the place, and I think by the time I got there, I'm quite easily grumpy, and I think I accidentally sort of let that show. And so a couple of weeks later, I was in LA actually, I said, did we hear anything about um, Sherlock, by the way? He said, well actually, yes we did, they didn't really feel you were that into it. I was like, well, why, what do you mean? He said, well they just felt you, you hadn't really turned up. <laughs> you know, I was like, Fuck. Well can you please let them know I'm really interested, I think he's, the script is brilliant. So, so I went back again and read with Ben and as soon as we started reading, yeah, it was clear that we had a, a chemistry and the room sort of crackled a bit. You could feel it. The, the material elevated. That's what you always try and do, whatever department you're in. I've always never really tried to make any big delineation between television and theatre and fit. It was like, well, if I like the writing, I'll, I'll do the writing, you know, because I, I will go anywhere for good writing. I haven't got Tom Cruise's film career, so it wasn't, it wasn't like, I'm only going to do massive leads in massive films. Like, well, that wasn't what was happening anyway. I, I think I've always dodged around a bit between the media. An adventure? No, I don't imagine anyone west of Bree would have much interest in adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Make you late for dinner. <laughs> mm. Mm. Ah. Good morning. I remember going with, with half of Britain, I went on tape for it, right? And when I, when I arrived in the casting room to go on tape, rather like this, there was a note from Guillermo del Toro, who at the time was slated to direct. And the note was very nice. It said, look, Martin, we want this to be you, so do your stuff, but just so you know, we think this is gonna be you. And I was like, 
wow, that's amazing, how fantastic. So that relaxed me a lot, you know, so I was able to do my reading and then sort of forget about it. We were filming Sherlock. We were filming the first series of Sherlock, so I sort of had that on my mind. Guillermo left the project as director, but he, again, he reached out and said, just so you know, it's not gonna be me, but you are still the person we want in the frame. You're gonna hear lots of different names. Again, big Hollywood stars. The artistic team want this to be you. That's a massive vote of confidence. As it, as it went on, because I had to do series two of Sherlock, I couldn't do Bilbo, I couldn't do it. The BBC weren't playing ball. <laughs> No one was interested on the, the, the Sherlock or the BBC side of, okay, let me, let's see how this can work out. And I remember distinctly, I was outside the National Theatre in London, I was about to go and see a, a play, and I said to my agent, Michael, I'm gonna have to let this go, aren't I? And he said, I'm, I'm really sorry, I think you are, because we are contracted to do Sherlock. And then I was rehearsing a play, and I got a call from Michael saying, there's been a change of plan, Peter Jackson has rearranged the schedule of The Hobbit around you so that you can start The Hobbit, then go off and do Sherlock, and then finish The Hobbit again. And that was quite a phone call. That was an amazing, amazing thing to hear, because talk about a vote of confidence. He could have had a lot of people doing Bilbo Baggins, and the fact that he had that much faith in me was astonishing, really. And the fact that he can move a schedule as titanic as that is going to be in a production like that, which does not move quickly, was... Uh, kind of amazing and I felt like an extremely lucky person and, I, and I'll always love Peter for that. I've always had quite a, a black and white <laughs> feeling about, no, it's, it's over now, it's over. Once you've made the thing, it's uh, everything is supposed to end and thank God we recorded it, we pressed record. But uh, the last day I did get emotional because a couple of people approached me and as soon as their voice started to break, I was like, God, yeah, this has been the last two and a half years of my life. With breaks, but that's a huge chunk of anyone's life and the old cliche, it's we were sort of a family, you know, as you as you are when you're together for any length of time. She's um my wife my wife, she's uh Oh hell. Um look, I think I uh she's in the basement dead and uh look, I'm freaking out here. I don't know what to do. Lester, have you been a bad boy? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. A hammer and uh, look, can you come over? I'm on, I'm on Willow Creek Drive, number 613. Please, sure, Lester, I'll be right there. Thank you, thank you. I was shooting series three of Sherlock, I was in a hotel in Wales, and my Agent at the time said, look, we've got this American TV show. And so I was like, hang on, hold your horses. We've agreed, I'm not gonna do it, you know, because at that time it was signing on for seven years and all that. And I'm like, I'm just never, I'm never gonna do that. I'm a dad, I'm never gonna do it. So he said, yes, but this is, there's no signing on for seven years. It's 10 episodes. It's a TV version of Fargo. I'm sending you the pilot. And I read the pilot. There's a scene between my character and Billy Bob Thornton's character in an ER. So compelling, so beautifully written. This kind of weird Svengali type guy reeling me in and disturbing me. And I could immediately see how it would work. And of course I was in. You let a man beat you in front of his children to send them a message? No, that's not... Just heck. In my experience, if you let a man break your nose, then next time he tries to break your spine. Sent no way. Mm -mm. I mean, I, I don't think. The other thing was that because, partly because of the physical thing of the accent, the technical thing of the, the Minnesotan accent, I wanted to reward their trust in me, actually, you know. I got along very, very well. <laughs> with Billy Bob Thornton. I would hesitate to say in any way that I made him better, but he certainly made me better uh, because he, he's very settled, a very calm presence on set. We got on straight away. I play a game on almost every set. If you're sitting around for more than 10 minutes, I say, okay, let's name bands and singers beginning with the letter that the last one ended in. So if I say the Beatles, then you say Susie and the Banshees, S. Okay, Sex Pistols, that's a lot of S's actually. But so yeah, we just did that for ages. He's a very under, whelmed man. You know, he's not a kind of flighty <laughs> uh, presence. And I, and I liked that. So how does it feel? Spend all that time, all that effort, and to see it fail so spectacularly. Did it. Well, I became part of the Marvel Universe at the behest of Kevin Feige 
saying he, you know, they were interested in me playing this part. And that was at the end of 2014. I was filming in Malta. I don't think I'm imagining this. I had a long conversation on the phone with Kevin Feige, I think. Very gracious and generous, and he wanted me to play this part. And the idea was three films. That was the idea. Within that, I didn't really know any detail whatsoever. Less than a year later, I was in both the States and Berlin doing my fairly small bit on Civil War, but introducing this part of Everett Ross among a load of uh, superheroes. It was kind of funny, it was, it was funny. I think it was maybe my first out and out horror, I guess. In the email that came with the script, they referenced the film Sleuth, uh, which was an early 70s film starring Laurence Olivier and Michael Caine, which for years as a kid was my favorite film. It's absolutely my favorite film. And there's a part in it where Michael Caine's character disguises himself as somebody else and then reveals, which I always loved. And the first time you see that film, it's, it's a delight. Inspector Plotter becomes Inspector Doppler. If you see what I mean. So there's a, an echo of that in ghost stories as well as many other things, but they sort of had me at sleuth really. It's like, well, if you're pulling on that, then let's, let's go. I was filming on that job for two weeks and without question, without question, it was one of the happiest two weeks of my working life. It's very odd. Trump was elected during it, right? It was so it was so strange. It was so odd. It was like the very, very surreal thing of coming onto set, people looking at each other going, What's going what's going on? What's going on? And so then and then we had to make a, a film that was sort of slightly less bizarre than something that had just happened in real life. It was yeah. System rebooting in five, four, three, two. Yes! We did it! Great! Now get out of there! The first time I met Ryan, he came into the room and gave me a hug, and I thought, oh, we'll, we'll be all right here, you know. I like huggers. He was just, he's a very sweet man. In many ways, I, I'm slightly, you know, I'm slightly outside. I wasn't one of the cool guys, I was you know, like, I mean Everett Ross is a cool character, but he's he's outside of the world, do you know what I mean? So he's outside of the main core of the story, I suppose. Every, everyone was cool and it was, we all got on, it's like any other film. I remember at the time people going, what was it like being like the only one? It's like, well it was like, it was like making a film, <laughs> like loads of people working very long hours trying to get a film made, it was exactly like that. But the ratios were different. Do you know what I mean, the ratios were sort of reversed. But it's a funny one with Everett because he has, he has real status in his job, and then he's put in a world where he has very little status, and he's completely fucking bamboozled by what he's discovering about this hidden country. It was good. I liked it. I liked Atlanta. Loads of dogs. I mean, I really did. I walked around Atlanta a lot. Yeah, it was. It was it's a good place. Very easy to put on weight in Atlanta. Jesus. Southern fried portions, my God. You know, it's American portions generally, like, who else is coming? Who else do you think is arriving? I can start back as soon as possible. And you're actually going to? Well, what else am I going to do? I'm a police officer. It's all, about... it's all I know, Yvonne, and I am f***ing good at it. Good for you, Steve. It's directed by a man called Paul Andrew Williams, written by a man called Jeff Pope, who's one of our finest drama writers in the UK. I play a, a real-life cop. There was a case some years ago now in the southwest of England. There was a double murder. This cop was able to expose the fact that this man confessed to two murders, but because not every single T had been crossed and I had been dotted by the book, this cop's career has sort of hit freefall and now can't get a job in England. The style of it, again, was is about as real and the, the sort of, the style of acting that I really love was no acting. Don't 
bring any acting to it because the, the story itself is dramatic enough and the events themselves are amazing enough without you emoting all over them or without you telling the audience what to think with your performance. I like exercises in stripping away everything. I like working in that sort of area where the audience has to kind of keep up, I suppose. Big acting is great sometimes, but, I, I, but for the purpose of this, the way it's shot, shot in an almost docu-style, everything was handheld, you almost miss little bits of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, what did he say? Oh, th you know. Pulling hair is wrong, mate. I mean, all violence is wrong, but you know, at least punching's a sport. Is it? Yes, boxing. Boxing's in the Olympics, hair pulling isn't. It would be funny if it was. It really would be. <laughs> I had a dream one night. Well, I dreamt the first scene of the first episode. And I said to my partner at the time, Amanda, I said, I've, I've had this dream and described it to her. I said, I think that might be some, there's a show in that somewhere, I think. And she said, yeah, I think there is. You should talk to someone about that. And she didn't mean a therapist. She meant a TV executive. I was put together with Chris Addison as a potential director. And then we got together with Simon Blackwell as a potential writer. And between us, we kind of worked up this, what the show was going to be tonally, stories wise development meetings were basically like parental therapy groups where you would admit to all the worst things you've ever done as a father and all the things that made you least proud of your own behavior with a lot of laughter actually you know when you're admitting things that you don't readily admit to it's, it's sort of outrageous and reassuring that it's not just you and i think you you see a side of parenting that everyone i think needs to talk about i really do believe that everyone needs to talk about the difficulty of it and the chaos of it as well as the joy and the absolute love of it, you know. That's the easy bit, man. The easy, like loving your kids is the easy bit. Wanting to die for your kids and kill for your, that's the easy bit. The hard bit is when you realize that you are sometimes completely incapable of doing the job well. Uh, that's the hard bit, because it, it doesn't make you feel great about yourself. Sounds hilarious, doesn't it? I've got to see that show.